Hi there, and welcome back to the Hub of Junior Golf Podcast. I'm Ryan Burr, joined as always by the founder of the Junior Golf Hub, Roger Nick. And Roger, certainly a great time of year uh, in the Northeast. You, you start in the month of February into March to get some hope that uh, golf is is coming around. Certainly the college seasons, which we spend so much time talking, recruiting, and whatnot. Just about every team in the country played last week, this week, or next, next week as the start of the spring season. So certainly we want to start uh, highlighting some of, of those events. Also would like to get into uh, on this podcast, certainly talking um, and mentioning some players that have uh, committed um, from the junior ranks and decided what college they have decided on. So uh, be sure to let us know if you've committed and, and we'd like to, to give you a shout out on here. Uh, with that said, Roger, some uh, some USGA news we were just discussing that will affect certainly uh, a portion of our uh, older boy junior golfers that are trying to make a splash and make it to the U.S. amateur, a, a change to the qualifying system. It is a change. It's a big change. Um, I think it's going to throw uh, a lot of people off guard on when, when to start preparing for the U.S. Sam again. And uh, and that local qualifier, and who needs to, uh, the local qualifier, right? So I, I think one of the things that uh, I think is still up in the air is like who is who has to go to the local qualifier versus being able to get into the you know exempt 36 you know whole qualifier uh, or the regional to to get to the U.S. Open. So it, it's going to be interesting. Um, I think it's a it's a play to get more people to qualify. I don't know how that's going to work um, with so many kids playing around the country in college during the spring season, how that's going to affect their chances of qualifying. You're going to have some great players playing against each other, against each other who might <laughs> knock each other out. And who knows, right? I, I think there's some question marks still. And, and I think that the biggest thing for me is this debate of other countries in the United States. In the U.S., we have junior golf. Certainly, there are some great national tours that are used here in the junior golf. We have junior golf ranking systems. The rest of the world, often in the junior golf game, go to start building their wagger. Mm -hmm. And certainly, uh, that hurts if, if there's an event that is doing exemptions based on your wagger. Almost no matter how good of a junior golfer you are, if you're playing junior golf, if you're playing junior golf hub, Nota Big Gay, if you're playing AJGA, you're not accumulating uh, you know, world amateur golf rankings. You're accumulating a, a beautiful junior golf resume to go play division one golf. But you're, you know, very, very rarely are amateur uh, junior golf events also wagger rent maybe more and more it's happening but the reality is in other countries and we'll get that get into this with our guest um if the usam is using wagger as their exemption system that obviously uh causes some problems for our junior golfers in the united states it, it does and, and i think ryan you make a good point i think everywhere else in the world we talk about amateur golf right not junior golf in in the u.s we we kind of denote the difference between junior golf and then amateur golf and quite frankly in in countries that have developmental programs they talk about amateur golf and you progressively move through their development system and you get chances to play in these events and you qualify for these events where we clearly you know separate junior golf from amateur golf even though it's still technically amateur golf we just call it something different so so i think it is very interesting from an international perspective that they have i think a leg up when it comes to that qualifying when it comes to wagger uh or any other kind of competition that way even though in the u.s we have obviously massive amounts of competition and massive amounts of players um, it just they just don't progress through the same rankings, which is again back to some of our conversation about college coaches recruiting international players versus American players or domestic players. Is that they're just more cultured, more uh, kind of used to playing at a higher level tournament, you know, if you will. And there would be no better example of that than our guest today on the Hub of Junior Golf podcast. He is a two-time winner on the PGA Tour. He's won on just about every other tour, including tours you've never heard of. He's played all <laughs> over the world. A uh, winner two times on the PGA Tour, Corn Ferry Tour, Asian Tour, Challenge Tour, Swedish Tour. 
He, of course, is Daniel Chopra. And Daniel, want to give a little bit of your background. You were born in Sweden. Your mother is Swedish, your father Indian. You moved to India at age seven. And obviously, all of this happened as you are growing into one of the very best players in the world, ultimately make it to the highest level where you've won two times. Conversation Roger and I were just having, and welcome to the program, is the USGA has just announced that the United States Amateur, obviously a gigantic event, uh, Nicholas Dunlap, of course, is the defending champ. He just won on the PGA Tour, has added an 18-hole qualifier to their already 36-hole qualifier to get to the USM. Uh, the conversation is there are, are exemptions for Wagger and around the world, and I'm curious for your take on this growing up uh, abroad, junior golfers abroad often concentrate on a Wagger, where here in the United States, of course, it is your it's your junior golf ranking and playing a lot of junior golf that aren't uh, world amateur golf ranking attached to it. So now that you have a stud son that's going to play uh, very high end division one golf. And of course you did it a completely different way. What are, what are your thoughts on amateur golf everywhere else and junior golf here in the U S well, first off, uh, I have to say that, uh, you know, growing up in India, uh, for me, I was very fortunate uh, growing up at Delhi Golf Club, uh, a lot of junior events, and that gave me access to competitive golf. Uh, and then excelling at that, then I started looking uh, towards the horizons and what would lay across it even perhaps in uh, the United States and Europe and Asia uh, was a part of that horizon for me. So I, I really think that uh, for me, it was the the prospect of the opportunity to one day play on a higher level and then climb the rungs of the ladder. Uh, if you don't feel like you have that opportunity, it's very easy to go, well, this is probably not a sport for me because I don't see myself being able to find a future in this game that is easily accessible. Um, and I think that uh, the World Amateur Golf Rankings is a way to do that, uh, to allow players from the obscure corners of the planet, as we're now seeing, there's people from Poland, Chile, there's people, right? We just had a guy from Chile yesterday shoot the all time lowest score in the history of the PGA Tour co sanctioned events, shot yeah. 57, Cristobal del Solar. So we're having people from uh, that it was not going to be long before we have a person from Russia, the Czech Republic. You know, we have players from Norway. Uh, obviously, Sweden's been around for a while, but, uh, you know, with Fiji and at all the corners of the planet. Now, the only way to really do that is to provide access to higher levels of competition for them so they can go and chase their dreams. Uh, and I think that is a it's a vital key and aspect to the amateur game leading into then, which will eventually become the professional game. Yeah, Daniel, that's uh, well said. I, I think one of the things that we find here in the U.S. a lot with the junior golf is how you talk about accessibility. We talk about, you know, opportunity, you know, there's so many tournaments, there's so many, you know, chances for kids to play, but then it does get li very limited uh, because of resources and other opportunities uh, that, that just doesn't open up uh, to more kids here in the U.S. Is that something that you've found, you know, around the globe as well? Obviously, it, it's, it's got to be difficult, right? Uh, I mean, extremely. Financially, it may be the hardest game in the world on the families of young and upcoming junior golfers. Uh, and I shudder to think uh, how many great talents we may have lost because financially it just wasn't feasible for those families to continue in a sport, which, uh, let's face it, I mean, if you get on a higher level, you've got to travel. You have airline tickets and or train tickets, and then you've got hotels and all that comes with it, restaurants every single night. Uh, so your expenses uh, exponentially increase. Um, and it, it really is difficult. Uh, you know, when you're representing a team on high school and colleges, that is all taken care of by the organizational body, the high school and or the college. So uh, basketball, football, baseball, all of those sports, you know, other than your own, if you have your own personal coach or whatever, really, uh, it's not going to be financially as taxing for those families. Golf is unique in that regard. Tennis, perhaps also a little bit similar. Um, but really, uh, it is it is a hurdle that is going to be hard to overcome without uh, massive organizational uh, governance and 
uh, investment into the junior game for excelling junior golfers that perhaps don't have the financial capabilities? Daniel, let's talk. Let's talk to the junior golf families. Um, you are the goal. You are the goal of thousands and thousands and thousands of parents that have 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 year old, 15 year old, 16, 17, 18 year old sons and daughters. You are the goal. They have mortgaged everything. Thousands of, of parents have mortgaged everything because their son or daughter is the next Annika, the next Tiger, the next Daniel Chopra. Uh, we see kids seven years old that are on a traveling the nation, playing a, a national schedule at age seven and eight. You're the goal. Parents really don't know because they've never made it. Very, very few of them, obviously. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot, you know, your son obviously plays, but the majority, the tens of thousands of junior golfers in this country don't have a parent that played on the LPGA or PGA Tour. You did. This is your avenue to talk to uh, the number one podcast in junior golf that speaks to parents that are looking for a roadmap, searching for answers. So now you're in the U.S. You have you made it to the highest level. You have a son that loves golf and he's very good at golf. You have options. Certainly, there is always a tournament somewhere in the United States. There's always a ranked tournament that, quote unquote, has the very best kids. Or there's local events where you never have to leave your bedroom and you can you can play against local kids and can play competitive golf. Where do you come in on parents? kids and when you think it's important that you really really go after it on a national and international level as a child well you have to be able to dominate uh that little it's like the little fish or the big fish little pond uh in order to progress to the next level you have to be realistic in your goals before you start going to regionals and state and then uh you know national events if you're finishing fifth in your local event, sixth, you know, give it another year. Give it another year. You never say he's never going to be a late bloomer. There's so many even professional golfers that just barely squeaked on by the first couple of years on tour. Then all of a sudden, they developed a little bit later. And there's several examples of that. And the same thing happens in junior golf. Something clicks in their brain. A little connection is made. And all of a sudden, things improve. But you have to make sure you dominate in your region, in your local area, before you move on to the next level. There's so many parents that are out there pushing the kids too hard. They go, okay, well, you finished fifth locally. If I push you a little bit harder and, and take you to the regionals, maybe you'll try a little bit better, and then then you'll perform. But that also can destroy a kid's confidence. Uh, you know, you get yourself absolutely beat up uh, on a higher level, not really good either for your confidence and or your motivation to continue one of the greatest games on the planet. Um, so parents, uh, I've seen a lot of nightmare parents out there now is particularly so with, uh, me following my son around and, and I'm seeing so many mistakes being made out there, uh, with parents pushing their kids a little bit too hard. And, and it's hard for me to bite my tongue sometimes and say, listen, I know I've done this. Don't do that. <laughs> can't do it. Obviously, you know, you can't tell. Uh, a parent how to parent their child but uh i see so many mistakes out there and parents sometimes are the worst enemies of their children especially when it comes to competitive sports yeah daniel you make a really good point there about the you know playing up or pushing their child maybe to that next level and i know ryan you know we, we talk at nauseum of, of rankings and and what uh parents are doing these days with manipulating tournament schedules for rankings to you know protect their ranking once a kid gets to a certain level. Um, and then it backfires, right? Because these kids no longer, you know, love the game. They don't play enough golf. They actually start kind of fearing going out there playing because they now are going to lose their ranking spot, maybe lose that recruiting spot. What's some advice there for a parent and, the you know, one of the kids who want to play at the highest level? What's, what's your advice there? Play or don't play? Well, I, here's the thing with me. Uh, I can only go from my own personal experience, and I think it works a lot for especially children in the 10 to 15, 16 uh, region is less sometimes is more. If they want to play golf seven days a week, let them play three days a week because then they'll cherish the time that they go out and spend on that driving range or the 18 holes that they go play with their buddies or by themselves or whatever it may be because they feel like, I'm not going to be able to play tomorrow. I'm not going to maybe play the day after, but I'll play on Friday or whatever it may be. Pull them back a little bit. 
because then that heightens your concentration and your focus level on the time that you spend on the golf course. I always say, don't practice harder, practice smarter. So even when the days that you go out and practice, they're going to hit balls for three hours. A good parent will say, okay, fine. You get to hit balls for one hour. Mm -hmm. If you want to go chip and putt, uh, you know, for two hours, make them chip and putt for three hours. That's fine. Uh, you can never have too much chipping and putting practice, but hold them back off the range. Don't be the range rat. Just don't be out there hitting golf balls. So pull, you got to pull them back. And that forces you to really hone your skills on the few shots that you have and you actually give it higher focus. So really, you got to rein in your kids a little bit and don't just give them full access because that's when you get burnout. Uh, you have see you see so many kids out there you just they get sick of the game. They want to go hang with their friends and go to the cinema. They want to go hang out at the mall. They want to be spending six hours of range uh, on the driving range every single day. So, you know, you have to be smart in how you handle your kids when it comes to practice and play. Daniel, that is uh, that is the exact opposite of what is happening. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's I mean, that is that's really good advice. But that is, you know, it is the opposite. We are seeing and and all three of us uh, play golf and are lucky enough to be able to go where we you know, we can see what's going on out there. And and certainly and I'll say it's actually in my community, it's actually girls uh, more so than boys. And there's no exaggeration here. I have girls where I live uh under 12 that on a on a bad day it's eight hours and that's every single day they're homeschooled and it is it's seven to seven and it's every single day now the tough part and as a competitive parent that that obviously had a very high-end player the tough part and this is why i would love your feedback the tough part is the parent is you know that is happening. So the reality of a parent is if someone is practicing five times as much as your kid, they're going to beat them. They're going to be better. So as a parent, how do we know, how do we, how do we come to grips with the fact that, well, little Johnny has been out there since 7 a.m., 400 consecutive days, <laughs> <laughs> How are we going to compete with that as a parent if we want our child to be the best that they can be? Well, uh, well, there's so many examples in the professional games. You have the VJ Sings that will spend 10 hours on the range. But he's really, if he's honest with you, he'll tell you he just loves to do it. He's got nothing else to do. Uh, then you have guys like Colin Montgomery uh, that would never hit balls on the range. He'd practice for like 20, 30 minutes, and that was just to go tee off. You have Carlos Franco who never hit a ball on the range before teeing off. He'd do some stretches, go tee off. And that was it. So, yes, uh, there are situations in which the more you do something, the better you will get at it. That is absolutely 100% right. But out of those eight hours, how many of those hours are they 100% focused on exactly what they are trying to do and what they're trying to achieve? So you're going to have the nightmare scenarios as well. Michelle Wee is one that I will give. You know, was pushed tremendously hard by her parents early on, but then the burnout took out. So yeah. she retired. I mean, she basically played half a career. Uh, you have so many of the lady golfers out there that uh, Lorena Ochoa, another one, uh, retired super young in her career. Annika Sormstan uh, retired pretty young as well. You know, the greatest player that ever lived uh, on the women's side. So women tend to retire a lot earlier. Part of the reason is exactly the example that you just gave because of the fact that a lot of their parents push them just that little bit harder and and they feel and then that burnout comes they don't get to do the things like i mentioned before go hang out with their friends go watch a movie go hang out at the mall do normal kid things so eventually when they get into their early young 30s they'll go like you know enough of this i've made enough money i'm good now i now want to go live my life and do the things that i was never able to do before but how are you how are you the ultimate competitor you won on the pga tour you're now a parent of a good player that obviously you're, he is using the techniques that you are recommending on this podcast. So at what point as a competitive father, and he obviously wants to reach his dreams, he's obviously not practicing as much as, quote unquote, the very best players his age. And somehow you are okay with that now. But at what point and then 
how do you or how does he make up for the time that he has missed out compared to his peers that are out there seven days a week? Well, he has a little bit of an advantage. He has me uh, to watch <laughs> over him. Uh, no, it's it's true. Uh, I mean, I'm a professional golfer. You know, I can I can guide him in the right direction when he's hitting golf balls, and I watch him hit balls. The information he's getting from me is uh, as good, if not better, than some of the PGA professionals out there that don't necessarily know that kid as well, personality wise. So I give him great advice, and I teach him just the basics. I don't really mess with his golf swing so much. Kids are so good at mimicking nowadays. He'll go on YouTube, watch videos of Adam Scott, Tiger Woods, Rory McIlroy, Justin Thomas, all those guys. And he just goes on the range and he just does things like that. Uh, and then I'll just pay attention to his, uh, his setup. And I would encourage all the parents that are not good golfers themselves, just let their kids go to YouTube. If they don't, can't afford uh, a PGA professional to go help them with their golf game, um, go and watch YouTube. Just go mimic uh, what they see out there and they're so good at it and that's the one thing that is uh really incredible about this sport especially with younger children is their ability to copy some of their heroes uh, and they'll do it very efficiently as well yeah i think that's a, a, a good point daniel and uh, we see that uh, throughout the years right i mean there's been so many players that are now on the tour and have been on the tour for years you know adam scott uh, referenced tiger woods right i mean hey i watched tiger woods and you know, try to emulate what he does and uh, Aaron Baddeley and other players uh, the like, right? So many guys have done that with Jack Nicholas. You know, I actually have a, a junior golf academy, the Golf Performance Center up in Connecticut. We have a full-time academy for kids. Um, but to your point, one of the things that we want to make sure that we do with our players and, and to the parents is we're, we're, we're focused on helping the whole person develop uh, versus just golf swing technique. So that I think that's such a small part of it. Um, especially for junior golfers. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that parents who do actually end up coming to our academy and we sit down with them and tell them about, we're, we're going to be talking about their mental skills and developing, helping them develop their mental skills, their academic skills, their, their life skills, their, you know, their physical skills, you know, uh, all of the other things that go along with being human beings. Um, and it's so funny how many of some of these parents would turn around and go, yeah, but what about their golf swing? Well, what about that? I'm like, no, you don't, you don't get it. It, it is such a, a last thing to develop, right? It's to let them, you know, kind of discover and, and, and focus on being the best athlete, being the best person, uh, developing the best mindset, best, you know, mental skills, uh, all of that comes into play. And, but parents just don't get it. And, you know, we've been doing, I've been doing this now 20, 25 plus years and we've had a lot of success and they still go, oh, my God, but I want them to look like, I mean, they see some guy, I'll use George Gankus. Well, hey, but this guy does this and he should be doing these things. Eh, well, if you want them to maybe be a flash in the pan, sure. You want them to quit when they're 20, maybe. But, you know, develop the, the best person you can, the best athlete you can, and allow them to work on just developing golf skills you know, as it relates to the game, right? And enjoy that process. And I think we see a lot more kids embrace that, but parents, boy, they are so quick to, no, you, you got to do it this way. Yeah, Roger, you know, uh, you make a great point. And that's something I wanted to tackle on the show uh, today as well is, um, as I mentioned before, now that I'm seeing a lot more in the junior game, uh, the way the kids behave out there, and it's not just in the junior game as well. Um, the professional golfers, these young guys coming out of college, uh, talking about uh, life skills and whatever. Nowadays, coaches, uh, parents just go to coaches and go, teach my golf, uh, teach my child the golf swing, how right. to play golf. Etiquette is one thing that gets left by the wayside. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody always used to say golf is a gentleman's game. You call the penalties uh, upon yourself. It's an honorable sport. I am seeing some absolutely horrendous etiquette right now, uh, especially junior golfers. Uh, mm -hmm. They're pretty young. They have no idea. Parents have even less idea. Um, and then it, it filters into young professional golfers that get out on tour. You know, they've been in college. The college coaches, they're out there. They're basically glorified managers. They don't even touch the player's golf swing. They work a little bit of the sports psychology as well. And they certainly don't teach golfing etiquette. Right. Now, that is something that I think perhaps uh, – could be incorporated. I remember me as a junior golfer that we would have a, in India. This is back in the 80s. Now uh, we would have a mandatory 
15 minute uh, seminar on the putting green where we'd have somebody and tell us about this is what you're allowed to do. This is where you can stand. You don't st sit on your cell phone. No cell phones, obviously, back in the 80s. But nowadays, don't be on your cell phone. Don't be walking around behind another player as they're reading their putter, getting ready to hit their shot. Don't be clanking your club. Don't be all of that kind of stuff. It doesn't take very long. 15 minutes can cover pretty much all of it. But kids yeah. nowadays, uh, they have no clue about the et etiquette of the game. Is and it is also such an important aspect of this great game is because it what separates us from all of the other sports uh, in the world where you're trying to cheat, you're trying to fool a referee, you're trying to give the odd elbow into your fellow sportsman on the other team. It doesn't exist in golf. And golf is sets itself apart in that regard. Even tennis now is starting to get, you see players chirping at the other player. If it's not going mm -hmm. well, you'll do have all kinds of gamesmanship. You'll get off the court, even though you don't need to for 15 minutes, make ice them a little bit. Right. Golf is not like that. And I think that's an aspect of this game that we're kind of losing a little bit. And, you know, with Ryan and Nota Begay in the series, the Nota Begay Junior Series that you have, that you work and do such a great job on, perhaps could be uh, a, a venue for this experiment and, and make the players sit down, you know, for 15 minutes and have somebody go out there and, and explain to them. Because well, uh, I really am very upset about some of the etiquette that I have seen uh, uh, in the golfing world in the last decade or so. Well, Daniel, you make a good point. I mean, again, part of our what we do with our kids and throughout our academy, we have a we have a um, a system that they all kids have to go through and learn different etiquette, different things. So they have to pass a test on etiquette, you know, rules, and they have to go through history uh, in order for them to actually be able to participate in certain events. So before they get out there, it's it, it's a big part of that. And, and But you're absolutely right. We see it, even as we go through it, we get the players or feedback from players that we have in in, uh, in events and saying, man, that kid was just cheating. Well, did you call them out on it? I mean, even learning how to do that and, and being respectful to the field um, is really hard for these kids, right? right. Because it's not, it's not what's happening out there, right? It, it, it's like uh, dog eat dog and I'm gonna put you down because I wanna win because you know what, I go home, if I don't win, I'm gonna hear it from my parents. Like, well, why didn't you do that? Why didn't you call this rule? Why didn't you call this? And it's it's such a um, a bad precedent that's happening in, in so many ways, but I'm glad that you're you're on it. And I agree, uh, you know, Ryan and Noda and their team uh, do a great job at the events and trying to get kids to understand that this is a gentleman's game you know, be respectful um, to and, and honor the game, right? So really good stuff. Daniel, I, I want to, uh, and we'll let you get out of here. It, it, uh, you've been incredible. And certainly uh, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of, a lot of uh, moms and dads listen to this podcast in the car right now that are, that are shaking their head in agreement to some of the things they've seen out there. Uh, you've given us a, a lot of uh, lessons and, and ideas. If, if that kid does everything you've described and then that fire is burning bright and the potential is there and they are dominating the local level whether it's 18 holes 36 54 what age do you think is most and, and and i'm sure i mean i shouldn't say i'm sure what age did you know as a teenager that you were ready to make this what you wanted to do 24 7 and what age do you think is appropriate for the boys and girls and parents out there to just let it rip. Well, you have to also take it with a little bit of a grain of salt. Uh, we're living in a different time now. When I was 12, I knew what I wanted to do with my life. Uh, however, that was 1985, 84 in India. Uh, no internet. We had no television. Uh, there was nothing for me to do in my life other than golf. And even that I could only do three days a week. Some days it was some weeks. It was four days a week. So, I would play other sports. I was playing cricket. I was playing soccer. Uh, I was playing a whole bunch of other stuff, tennis. So I was multi-sport, but my peak of my focus and my concentration was on golf. I would encourage parents to allow their children to go play other sports because it's amazing what you can learn. Um, just ball, hand-eye coordination with other sports can actually help those connections in your brain to become a better golfer. Now, so if you are dominating now, uh, in at your regional level or whatever it may be. I knew when I was 14 years old that I could play this game professionally. I came second uh, in an Indian professional golf tour event. They had a full 35 tournament schedule. 
and I was 14 years old and I came second uh, in a tour event. And I would have my statistical charts every time I played a tournament, uh, especially in a professional tournament, I would jot down my scores and I still do it to this day, how much money I would have won in that event had I been a pro. <laughs> Using those numbers, I was then able to figure out that I was making enough money, even though I was an amateur, to be self-sufficient and being able to pay for the ride to the next event and for my whatever accommodations and all that. So I was using that. So when I was 14, I already figured out that, hey, I'm good enough to be a pro, at least on the Indian tour. And then I'll go from that tour, go work my way up. And I knew I was only 14. By the time I'm 18, I'm probably going to be better. So then I'll be able to get up to the next tour. And then I did so and I turned pro when I was, I, I could no longer play junior golf and I was 18. So you really dominate your level. And then by all means, if you have the financial capabilities, send your kid out to the next level, then let him dominate there uh, and let him see how far he can go or she. Yeah, well said. I think that's a great way to do it. Uh, you know, crawl, uh, walk, run, right? And uh, go for it. I love that. Uh, well done. Uh, last thing is, as we'll, I'll just put a cap on that, the, the college system, that's obviously not something you did. Uh, that is the goal for so many of our uh, viewers and listeners. Uh, now that you've lived here, obviously, uh, very Americanized, a great uh, broadcaster on American uh, television. Uh, now that you've lived here, seen it, what are your thoughts on the American college system uh, for, for then going, you know, is, is whether that's the goal or, or the goal is to move on from there? What is your thoughts on the system? Well, I think it's a fantastic system. Part of the reason it's so successful is you have people from all over the world, and this is America is where they come to go to college, uh, you know, and uh, it benefits this nation tremendously where you're basically whipping off the cream of the crop of uh, all of the young minds from around the world. And eventually, if they come to college here, most of them will stay here and help benefit this country. But that's a different topic. Now, we're talking sport now. Uh, but it is, it is fantastic, I think, especially for the children, as you mentioned, there's so many kids now, golfers, that are being homeschooled or they go to school maybe two days a week and then three days they just play golf and the parents. And I don't think it's necessarily socially a good thing for those kids because they become a little bit antisocial. School, college, college specifically is extremely, it's a social experiment. You get to learn how to interact with other people uh, what works when you can say this, you cannot say that you can do this. You can't do that. You understand that there's pros and cons. There's consequences for actions and mistakes. And you learn that the hard way when you are basically on your own in the college uh, level and you're out away from home and you have to live by yourself. You understand if I spend more money than I have in my bank account, I'm probably going to miss a meal or two next week, you know? <laughs> So understanding all of that, that I think is a valuable aspect just to understanding life uh, and how it works on the larger scale. The degrees nowadays, as good as they are, sometimes doesn't do anything for you. And then there's plenty of people out there with nothing degree wise, but you know they have a sharp mind and, and, and they are charismatic and they understand how things work and uh, they go to the next level. But I think college is a, is a huge aspect just to develop the young man or woman's mind to be able to succeed in the future and whatever endeavors that they try to pursue. Awesome. Uh, can't thank you enough, Daniel. You've been uh, a wonderful guest with a wealth of knowledge, obviously making it to the highest level and now experiencing the junior game in real time. So we thank you so much for joining us on the Hubba Junior Golf Podcast. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thanks, Daniel. Nice to meet you. So, Roger, uh, very interesting on a lot of levels for sure. I think when you, you really start to think about uh, what Daniel was talking about, um, it, it really, you know, I'm, obviously you have an academy. And, you know, I think maybe the initial thought of a parent with an academy is, you know, this is how you go about it to play golf 24 hours a day, seven days a week by going to an academy. I think this is a good opportunity to talk about how you designed the Performance Academy and 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 how you've used your experience and wealth of knowledge in the game and not only on the course, but off the course to develop uh, the academy. 
Yeah, Ryan, I, I think he makes great points, right, about what happens with parents and kids and development and what I think a lot of parents assume takes place for some of the best players or best athletes, best musicians, the best in the world, right? Um, and, and I think if we've learned anything, everyone's different, right? I, I think if we've learned anything in our society that there are, there are many ways to skin the cat, if you will. Um, and I try to look at best practices and think about, okay, if I were going to build the best person ever, what would that look like? And you take, you know, whatever teaspoons of this and the cups of that and a cup of this, right? Um, and then throw that in there and say, if I'm going to build the best athlete, the best golfer, or the best football player, or best musician, uh, I have to sprinkle in all of those uh, ingredients to to make it work, right? They One, they need to be inspired. They need to be sparked. They need to be encouraged. They need to be motivated. They need to have the best knowledge base. So bringing all of those things into one place uh, for someone who does has be, have, have the aspiration to be their best in a certain thing, then you have to have time, right? And then you have to have the right time and then learn how to time manage. And so from the Golf Performance Center perspective, I mean, I've tried to look at it from that perspective, which is if I were going to be in one place where I'm trying to be the best at something and I need these ingredients, if I have to travel around different areas to get them, it's going to take more time. It's going to take um, the consistency or the inconsistency that's going to determine whether or not I'm going to get the best information uh, over the said time that I have, right? So meaning that if I have a, a golf coach and I have a physical coach and I have a mental coach and they're not talking to each other, uh, but yet the same goal is in mind for the kid, each of them have their own kind of personal gain, if you will, uh, to do what they think is best, not what is best for the kid, best for the family or best for, you know, the ultimate result that they're looking for sometimes. And I think that's, you know, kind of what separates uh, what we do and what I think a lot of other academies do, which is it's about the kids' goals of being the best version of themselves and then building a plan in order to support that. Okay. They have to have, you know, the mental, you know, capacities and attributes to be successful in, in the academics. They have to know how to study. They have to know how to interact with people. They have to know how to uh, engage, as Daniel said, learn how to say the right things when the, when you need to say the right things and and learn if you say the wrong thing, what happens, right? So so that environment is so critical. And then you got to be able to physically do the right things, right? You got to be able to physically be able to function well enough that then inherently allows you to develop skills better beyond, you know, kind of I have a thing versus I have the ability to adopt to many things, right? So I, I think that's really critical. Um, and then social environment around others like you, that's just very motivating, very aspirational. Um, and, and then being able to have the golf aspect of it around, right? That's, it's not force fed every single day, eight hours a day. It's, hey, it's regulated, right? You know, we, you know these aspects of the game are a big part of it, but you're only gonna get to do some of that sometimes, right? Um, whereas I think that that's what, you know, parents believe is that I got to go play golf seven days a week, eight hours a day in order to be the best. Right. Listen, if you're motivated by that, if you're really, you know, um, love it that much, like he's mentioned VJ Singh or Tiger Woods or a Nota Begay or guys who just love every aspect of it, they're going to do it anyway. Right. Um, and it's no fear of burnout, right? It's the fear of burnout when someone's doing something they don't want to be doing. Uh, for the reasons that they don't want to be doing it, right? So I think that's the real fear of when it comes to academies, when it comes to golf development, because everybody does an academy, right? If I take my my kid to the local pro and I take my kid to uh, a physical trainer, if I take my kid to a sports psychologist, if I take my kid to the golf course, guess Thanks. what? It's an academy, right? You're running your own academy. It's just, do they actually work well together to right. make, the the support the person you're actually trying to do it for and in most cases i hate to say it they're just not on the same page right, right? And, and the knowledge base isn't isn't always there so so i think from the golf performance center standpoint i think that's what we do really well is create an environment that uh everyone's on the same page for the right reasons which is the child the development of the of the junior golfer uh and the junior athlete and the junior person right more more importantly right so so i think that's what we do really well 
So all of our listeners right now are writing down uh, Golf Performance Center. The easiest way to go about this, obviously, is uh, juniorgolfhub.com, juniorgolfhub.com. And as we always tell you, that's the best place to just start, whether an academy is right for your son or daughter, yeah. uh, whether it's a local tournament like Daniel talked about, dominate on the local level. Okay, how do I find a, what is a local, how do I find that? Juniorgolfhub.com. Uh, whether you're at in, whether you're taking your first step in this race, or, uh, you think your child is getting close to that finish line. The beauty of the juniorgolfhub.com is that it has that information for everyone on the race, everyone on the journey. And then if academies, the right for you, right for your son or daughter, uh, can't recommend the performance center enough where you get all those things by teachers and coaches and that are all together on the same page with your son or daughter. So juniorgolfhub.com junior golf is the best place to go. We thank Daniel Chopra. We thank Michael Nick, our producer and director. And Roger, as always, thank you. This was, uh, this was a good one. Very informative from a guy. I always find it interesting. The professional athlete, how different they made it there. How yeah. differently they look at the journey compared to the parents like myself that never got there and how the urgency and how we are just so caught up in the, the minute to minute instead of the year to year. So some great yeah. advice in there. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we're, we're uh, pumping out the podcast. We're getting unbelievable response from the junior golf committee. So we will continue to bring you uh, the best uh, interviews in the game of junior golf for Roger, Nick, Michael, Nick, I'm Ryan Burr saying thanks for watching the Hub of Junior Golf Podcast.